I have two for you then. Clicker time. but it was because they were interfering so we could vibrate the spring at, at different frequencies and it would send waves down they reflect back and come back and it's as they superimpose so superposition is going on and they interfere either constructively or destructively on a standing wave they match up they're in phase the reflected and the incident wave whatever the two waves <laughs> are matching up they interfere to make a standing wave. Again, that happens on the spring. That happens in an instrument. If you're playing a flute, it'll be in, in the air. We'll, inside the flute will create a standing wave. Uh, piano or guitar. Even a drum head, when you hit it, boom. You're forcing it to vibrate by hitting it. The source of all sound, waves. It naturally wants to resonate or vibrate at certain frequencies, it's a natural frequency, so it'll form that. And waves will actually go around two-dimensionally and form on it and create a standing wave because those waves will interfere as they bounce around. Questions? All right. What's a shock wave a result of? Different phenomena. That's a shock wave. A whip. The end of a whip actually moves so fast, it goes faster than the speed of sound. And it's actually creating a shock wave. That's what you hear when you hear that um, um, crack, thank you, of the whip. Yeah. It's, fun. it's a 
If you've ever noticed, the whip gets progressively skinnier and skinnier. And so I'm, I'm creating a wiggle on this end at the handle. I make it vibrate. But then that, this part of the, of the whip just goes up and down. That's the vibration. But the wave, the disturbance, travels along it. And as it gets skinnier and skinnier, it's changing the medium. It's like the guitar strings. We talked about different masses. As the mass gets less and less and less and less, the wave velocity changes. And it actually can go faster in something less massive. There's less inertia, so it can get through it quicker. Skinnier, skinnier. Until the end, it's going so fast, it breaks the sound barrier. It whips, whoosh, which compresses the air together. And that's the uh, shock wave that goes out to your ear from the whip. So, what are those waves doing to make that shock wave? Is it interference, superposition, amplification, or transference? superimpose on top of each other and they're all together. That creates a bigger amplitude. It's louder, but that's not what caused the shock wave. It was because they all superimposed on top of each other. Very good. All right, you can put your clickers away. Whoops. Go ahead and close that. <clears throat> I've meant to show you this animation of the longitudinal wave last time, so.
while he's doing it. All right, while I have this up, I'm going to do this. We have various sound sources here. Here's an 8,000. that we physically can't hear. But most people are between 20 and 20,000. As we age, we damage our hair cells by listening to too loud of music, sounds, or t listening to less loud but too long. Those hair cells, basically there's a membrane, and they're making the hair cells flex, sending signals to your brain, and these bend and flex. If you do that too much, too long, or too much all at once, they bend, they, they, they break, or they stay bent. They don't work anymore. They don't grow back. And so you, don't, you can't hear certain frequencies. And most people start losing higher frequencies first. So I'm going to ask TLT not to display this on uh, Desktop Presenter, and I'm going to disconnect because I don't want you to be biased. You'll just hear it. Raise your hand if you hear the sound. Put your hand down if you don't. And we'll see what your guys' range of hearing is. We'll start with the 8,000. Good. I hope all of you can hear that or you're in trouble. That was 14,000 hertz. Lost anybody yet? Okay, we lose you at sixteen thousand, in case you were curious. That was 22,000. I'm glad nobody raised their hand or I would have been wondering. <laughs> nobody heard that one? You did? I could tell if something happened at the beginning and end, but could you hear it in between? Yeah, the click doesn't count. Now. And it stopped. That's 20,000. So yeah, most of us, I can't hear it either. Got a couple. That was 19,000. Again. 18. Yeah, that kind of gives you your turn. Here's 17. Kind of fun. And 16. Oh, see, you heard 16 that time. <laughs> I have a friend. He, he actually does what I, I do at, in uh, Iowa. But he worked on a, grew up on a farm, actually, he still has one. And he's lost his high frequencies long ago. About, I don't know, seven, 10,000, he's out. <laughs> he can't even, so in other words, he wouldn't have been able to hear any of these. Poor guy. <laughs> I mean, he functions just fine, but that's our range of hearing. That's what our, our uh, ears can respond to. So we did, uh, Animals have different ranges, different animals. You know, you've heard of dog whistles. They can hear higher frequencies. We did the Doppler effect with this. This one's kind of fun. I just have a buzzer. 
There's a fixed frequency. It's pleasant. Well, let's move our sound source. All right, you want to catch it? Yeah, you. <laughs> Didn't say I could aim well. <laughs> All right, how about back there? Can you hear the shift? <laughs> What's fun to notice is if it's going sideways to you, you might not hear as big a change. But if it's coming at you or away from you, then we see those, like those animations. Glenn. Guess that means it's time to stop, huh? Oh, good. It just knocked it free. It uh, didn't break it. Yeah, all right. But that's the Doppler effect. And it works whether the sound is moving or you're moving or both. <clears throat> um, in Chapter 20, it specifies that uh, the sound in air you start with a pulse, so that it makes sense. It's a non-periodic vibration that travels. You know, it's like if you clap your hand. That's like me just wiggling the spring or the rope once. And we see the pulse travel. If I keep doing that, then I can send a train of pulses. And if they reflect back at certain frequencies, we can get those standing waves. But just a pulse, that can travel to you. You can see that with this, too. It's a toy. Here, I'll just, will you help me? This is called a space phone. And so you can create transverse waves, just like we did before. There's a pulse. But it's fun because it's coupled to the air. It's attached to a diaphragm, which is then goes through this horn, which helps couple it to the air better, instead of just like hitting a brick wall, atmospheric pressure. Kind of gradually does it. And you can hear it also. It can do longitudinal waves as well. If I flick it, you can see it compress and go back and forth. You try it. Yeah, here, flick it. That's my favorite. So you can hear those reflections and the echoes. You can talk into it too. Hello! Your turn. I like, uh, well, which ones travel? Do low frequencies travel? How about high frequencies? Can you hear that? Not as good, right? But I think it's more because I'm shaking. But anyway. Luke, I am your father. Yeah, you have to. Especially since uh, the newest one just came out on DVD yesterday. Anybody already get it? I do. <laughs> so we're, we're into spe specifically sound in chapter 20 now. Uh, these pulses. We already know half of this, though. It compresses and stretches back out. We know how sound can travel. It can superimpose. You know the definition. But sound, specifically, is a mechanical wave and needs a medium to travel through. It can't go through empty space. It needs gas, solid, or liquid. So what determines how it travels through something? It's, it's if the material is elastic. Tell me, what is something that's elastic? What? Any, yeah, anything you can think of that's elastic. Rubber band. Thank you. That's always the mo first one people generally, the first one they always talk about. Interestingly, um, that works most of the time. The uh, book defines elastic as it can spring back to undistorted shape. Yeah, nearly everything's elastic then, if you think of that, if it can bounce back. 
So it's not just stretchiness. It's not just the fact that you can stretch it. It's if somehow you distort it, will it rebound back? So think of something else now. A towing hitch. How about this ball? It seems to spring back. The spring would. What if you pull a spring too far? You overstretch it. Will it spring back? No, it's no longer elastic. What's something that's probably that you can think of that's not elastic now? It won't spring back. Pencil. Ah, if you break it. Yeah, that's true. Good. What else? Water? That's true. It kind of depends on how it's confined. So I could go either way on that one. Metals. Some metals. Yeah. If you, uh, like a, you had a bar and you bent it. Now these two are interesting because you could bend metal so that it can't spring back. You could do water to where it doesn't slosh back. But you could also take both of those where they do. And it's interesting because sound travels through both of those, through the material. Even if it's bent, it can go through it. Uh, something else that doesn't. I thought of pillow. You put your head on it. So sound travels through things better the more elastic they are. They, it goes faster the more elastic they are. So sound travels pretty well in um, solids. It's zippy fast. You heard the thing, you could, you could hear a train coming by putting your ear to the track and listening for the vibrations, the waves traveling through the rail before you could hear it in the air. So sound travels through air, but it also travels through metal. But it travels at different speeds because of their elasticity. It is. Solids are generally more elastic than liquids. Think of it. Their molecules and atoms are kind of, they're rigid and fixed. And so they can bump into each other. And, you know, they try to, the atom's trying to stay fixed. So if you try to nudge it, it kind of resists and it comes right back. They're, they're kind of trapped. All those Coulombic interactions between charges are holding them together. Now look at water. For example, you know, it's got an oxygen and two hydrogens. But they're not necessarily attached to a neighboring oxygen and two hydrogens. And so they can kind of bump into each other and knock each other, but they're not fixed together in a lattice structure or something. So they're a little less bound, less elastic. So sound actually travels slower in water than it does in most metals. And gas. Or there's an oxygen molecule. See it? Thank you. But it's not attached to anything. And there's generally more space. Gases are generally less dense than liquids, which are less dense generally than solids. And so it's this elastic property that d determines the speed at which uh, sound travels through something. I personally like to think of it as the interactions. If you're fairly dense and you're close together, it's really elastic, you're bunched really close together, kind of like these dominoes. So if you disturb one end and a wave tries to travel through, there's a lot more interactions. It can transfer that disturbance more quickly through it because that one bumps into that one, which immediately bumps into that one, and so on. As opposed to, say, this path. This could be like a liquid or gas, where they're farther apart. There's going to be less interactions. The, sturb the disturbance, uh, the wave of sound needs the medium to travel through. So if there's less interactions, it doesn't get through as fast. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to put these two together. And it's a kind of a one-shot deal here. And it happens quickly. And it's not a huge effect, but it's conspicuous enough. We ought to be able to see it. So you can zoom in if you want, but are you guys ready? Try it out here. I'll try to hit them at the same time. One, two, three. Who won? 
hope you saw this one. You know what? I have a slow motion video I took of it once. Why don't I pull that up? Because that'll be faster than resetting them back up for the moment. <laughs> I did it once for fun, and I thought, hey, I can show that. Hello, we don't need that much sound. Oh, I was trying to remember where I put it, sorry. That would be under waves. There it is. Again, or was you, were you good? Uh, again, the one. It's less elastic. That'd be like through air as opposed to a solid. So you can put waves on this rod, get some rosin on my fingers, and if you stroke it, you can stick to it and then it slips, stick, slips. It's, a, it's like a bow. Who plays a bowed instrument in here, anybody? Violin, cello, you know about the sticking and the slip. You got to put rosin on the bow, right? It's just so you grab it with friction, but then it slips, stick, slip, stick, slips at a certain frequency, and that's what gets it to vibrate. So I can get this rod to vibrate, actually. So I'm forcing it to vibrate, but it naturally wants to vibrate at this frequency we hear. Now, where do you think I'm holding? A node or anti-node? Because I, I'm, I'm forcing it to vibrate. It's sustained, so I've reached a resonant mode. We keep hearing it. So there's waves going down and reflecting back, and they're matching up. Okay, where'd you think I was holding? Node or anti-node? A node, yeah. That's the place where it's not trying to move. Watch what happens if I... Well, where do you think the anti-nodes are at then? Yellow would be a good guess, because why else would I put tape there, right? But that's wrong. <coughs> Where? In between here? Uh, sort of. Where is it free to vibrate the most? The ends. The antinodes are actually here. Let's try it. So if I hold it there, stops vibrating all at once. If I hold it, here it's moving too, but not as much. So it takes a little longer to damp out. Let me draw a picture of this. So see, if that's the middle where I'm holding, it's actually creating a wave like this. It's coming in and down, reflects. And there's our standing wave. So if this distance is L, what's the wavelength that we hear? I know, it's, it's not drawn like you're used to. You can draw it like that. 
That helps. See, we're stopping here at the anti-node, so we only have this part, only half of the wave. See, if we finished it, it'd be like this would be coming over to here and over to here to have the whole wave. So the wavelength of this one is 2L. Do you see that? The wavelength is twice the length. And then we could measure the frequency of this, which I don't know, but it's probably several, it's probably in the kilohertz. Given that, what could we determine? Very good, the velocity. We could know how fast sound travels in aluminum by doing that. So we could measure that frequency. We can visualize how it's vibrating. I'm going to change things up. And let's hold it in a different spot. So again, I'm going to force it to vibrate, but I'm going to change its natural resonant frequency by holding here. That'll force this to be a node. This will be a node also. Can you, can you start to see what the wave will look like? Let me do it, and then I'll go draw it. No. Let me draw it first. That one will look like this. So there's the middle. And these are about here and here. So now these are nodes. And then it reflects back. This is the anti-node. This is an anti-node. What's the wavelength now? Well, let's see. We got one whole bump, a half a bump here, and a half a bump here. So we have a total of two bumps. So it's like going from here up and back down. So this, the wavelength is L. It's half the size. Up here we had a half a bump and a half a bump. The whole wave you had to visualize. Does that make sense? Because this can be confusing. Yeah, well you only, this only has from here to here. So it looks like it'd be just a half a wave. You might be tempted to, well, let's say, so L, in this case, that, that length is one half of a wave. Rewrite that. That means the whole wave is twice that length. Yeah, it can seem confusing when you can't see the whole thing. Does that help? Down here, yeah, this length, L, is a whole wave. Because you have the one bump here, and another half, and another half. Heck, let's draw another one then. Let's do, did I, eh, I guess I did. Yeah, about here. I have some marks there-ish. What's that going to do? Well, this is going to be free to vibrate. And it's going to go through the node, because if I held it at this part, then it's going to You need another half here. It's, hard, it's fun drawing these to scale. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. So if I hold at this white piece of tape, like this, it would be that version. I'm going to force a wave, these parts to be nodes. And I'll get a wave that looks like this. Let's see, so how, how many waves are in, the, in here? This length has how many waves? Let's see, so here's a bump, one, two, so there's one wave. And then we got a quarter here. 
Well, half of one bump, half of another bump, so we got one other bump. So yeah, one and a half waves. You can think of that as three halves waves, which if you rewrite, that means the wavelength is two thirds of L, which is, is this. That's two thirds of the overall length. I'm seeing some furled eyebrows. Talk to me. Questions? No, I shouldn't have done that. I'll just get some more. So you can kind of visualize these waves that get set up on things and, and travel through anything. It's this, or if it's air in a column, the length of the column will determine what happens. These are three resonant modes. These are the first three resonant modes this thing can do. Beyond here, the waves will just get smaller fitting in here. You can fit more and more waves in this length. Which one, how will the frequencies compare? That's why I did this first before I, I did it. We heard this one. Let's do this one next. What do you th think you'll hear? Higher pitch? Why do you say that? Oh, good. We're not changing the velocity. It's still aluminum, so it still travels at the same speed back and forth. But if the waves are smaller, like this, they're going to yeah, reach you more frequently. It'll vibrate faster. So let's, let's compare. Good job, Kira. So here's the first one. Let me hold here. It's higher. And actually, since the uh, wavelength changed by a factor of two, it decreased by a factor of two. That went down by a factor of two. That means this went up by a factor of two. It's twice the frequency, which is an octave higher. Good, Glenn. Anybody want to sing those? I'm not going to try. <laughs> In range. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Glenn. <laughs> Sometimes I can get this other one. It's a little more ornery. But let's, let's hold down here now. Even higher. That, for you musicians, is two thirds of the switch. I should have figured this out ahead of time. Is that a fifth higher than this one? Anyway, it's some, it's, some, it's some interval, but not a whole octave that time. So how about an air? I've brought this up before, the speed of sound. The speed of sound in air, wrote it down. That is 340 meters per second, and that was at room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. The speed of sound at zero degrees Celsius, which way do you think it shifts? Now work this through. <coughs> if it gets colder, if the air gets colder, do you think it'll travel faster or slower? We didn't cover thermodynamics as much. Good, you're making predictions, but I heard both. Faster? Why? Good logic. Colder air is more dense, so that would be closer together. That's true. What else is happening? with those molecules. They're slowing down. They're not moving as fast either. So yeah, we, that would make me think that they would, uh, okay, if, you're, if you're, you're hot and you're moving fast, you can bump into your neighbor more quickly. If you slow down, it's kind of like the, this one. And it takes longer to bump in your neighbor. So that would make it go slower. But your reasoning would make it go faster. 
Which is why, see, you both guess, there were both guesses out there. <laughs> so I didn't expect you to know the answer. Who wins? Which effect is dominating? Well, slower. So they must be a, a big difference in their actual motion. When you cool something down, they're more sluggish. And that has a larger effect than the density. And you can relate this. It's mainly because we didn't cover it, but temperature is really just a measure of the average kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy of the molecules. You got molecules moving around. What's its velocity? How much does it tend to move linearly, translating? Well, on, they're all moving at different speeds. This molecule is going fast. Well, then it bumps into this one, and it transfers some of its energy. So now this one's going fast, and this one's going slow. But on average, they have a certain kinetic energy. The hotter something is, the higher the average kinetic energy. And remember, kinetic energy was related to 1 half mv squared. And that's one reason this dominates the effect. So temperature matters for the same material, because it changes the material. And so if you're uh, colder, they're not moving as fast. And it, I like to think of it as there's less interactions. Yeah, they're slightly closer together, but they're going a lot slower. That squared factor wins. And so they don't bump into each other, each other as often. And that works for solids and liquids, too. If we took that aluminum rod and heated it up and did it again, we would get different frequencies. Uh, in case you're curious, the speed of sound is four times faster, whoop, faster, in water. And it's 15 times faster in steel, just for a reference. Again, because liquids are uh, more dense and steel even more dense, like the dominoes. So in your head, interactions are more of the key than density here. Density can affect it, but it's the interactions that are the, are the key here. So I guess I will probably end with this one. How many have heard the thing um, that you can determine how far away lightning is in a storm? How do you do that? Mile every four seconds. Oh, so you know how fast it's going? So what do you do? You remember? How do you? Ah, so the difference between when you see the light versus, yeah, hear it. Because light travels faster. Way faster. 186,000 meters per second. Uh, yeah, that trumps that. So yeah, you, you see it almost instantaneously, in essence. But it can take several seconds before you hear it. It's just lightning is going through. It's, it's an electrical conduit to discharge, like we do with the Van de Graaff generator. But as it goes through the air, it heats it up. And when you heat something up, it expands. And that's like the whip. When you expand, you compress the air together. And there's your source of vibration. And then that vibration travels out as a wave through the, the, the atmosphere as a sound wave at the speed of sound. So yeah, it takes a lot longer to get to you. So here's a little uh, rule of thumb. Roughly, you can figure out the distance something travels is rate times time. It's velocity times time. If it travels 340 meters every second, and you counted for five seconds, What's that come out to? I didn't figure that out. 0, 20, 1,800 meters. That's how far it goes in five seconds. So you know you're that far away. But people don't want to, and what's a meter? It's still kind of hard to visualize for most Americans because we're not on the metric system completely yet. So the rule of thumb is for each second, it's roughly about a kilometer. No, 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 no. 
distance of every three seconds is a kilometer. That's right. So I, I figured the work out for you. So if you, yeah, you see lightning, cool, 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, it took three seconds for the sound to get to you. You know the speed of sound, you know the time, three seconds, 340 times three, zero, 12, uh, there, 1,020 meters, that's about a kilometer. So you know how far it is. If it took six seconds, it's about two kilometers away. Kilometers are different than miles, so if you have to know, five seconds is closer to a mile. Three seconds to a kilometer. It's fun. Kind of like when we drop the, something in a well. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, splash. We know the acceleration of gravity and how long it took, so we know how high up it is or how deep the well was. I like little things like that. So next thunderstorm, I guess, you can think back to that. Any questions? All right, we'll continue this more next time.